All right, uh, Brian Parker here with a, uh, another video, YouTube. Uh, collectionstopper.com is the website where all the free stuff is. I mean, lots of it. Um, I've tried to do uh, a lot of videos accompanied by what I call my show notes, which I read a teenth of to you. Uh, and try to give you the most in the video, but if you don't want to look at this, as I always say, you can go to my show notes, which will explain things to you. I'm not sure if the notes are going to be that good for you again, as I say today, but they're good for me to tell you. Uh, this one's a little weird. <clears throat> it's going to be titled, Why Judges Do What They Do. Or it could be titled, Don't Look for Any Judge to Go Your Way Ever Again. Um, I know that's going to be true. Uh, but I, I like to categorize judges in a couple of ways, but uh, mostly state versus federal judges. Um, I used to do all federal work. That's all I did is federal work. And I like it. Um, those judges work really hard to get appointed by Congress, uh, actually by the president, and then hopefully they're two senators, and then hopefully they get through whatever Senate confirmation hearings they have to go through. It's a tough run. So my belief was by the time they get there, they know how to work hard, and hopefully they'll work hard for you, or at least at their job. Perhaps, possibly, the opposite of that are state judges, which is more of a, um, a job than a destination uh for a lot of judges i'm going to give you my opinions and my experiences again <clears throat> this is <laughs> informational and educational purposes again the show notes probably aren't going to be that useful to you but there's tons of stuff on that website collectionstopper.com that is so useful to you as a person that wants to do their own case or an attorney wants to help themselves or help their client so there are two ways judges make it to the bench, at least in Michigan and probably most states. They're either appointed by a governor or some authority in that regard, or they're elected. But of the two ways, they all end up being in the one way, which is through an election. If they're appointed by the governor, they've done some work for the governor, uh, perhaps getting her elected, or they uh, were on her staff and something went wrong and they need to take care of them. So they give them a judge's position or uh, they are on in the same party as the governor. Their term has come up in Michigan. We have term limits and this guy needs a job. So what's more qualifying to be a judge than, Hey, I need a job. So, but of either way, the judge is looking to the next election. Uh, so even when you're appointed, you're either filling a space for the other person just left, or it's a plum position at the start of an election period, but you're gonna have to run again. So a lot of judges' positions, most of all, at least in Michigan, are six-year terms. So, so they can probably piss off a lot of people in their first three or four years, uh, and then they have to bear down and start being nice to the people they serve. Uh, and, and I say this uh, as judges, like we all do, if we want to keep our job, we act out of self-preservation. But for judges, and unlike most of us, the ass kissing and free lunches and everything else is a nice benefit too. Nothing wrong. Yeah, I guess there is something wrong with wanting to have your ass kissed. There's something completely wrong with that. Because... A judge position, in my opinion, I don't keep saying that, is should be a neutral, a neutral arbitrator, so that you can come to court knowing that you're going to get a fair deal and a fair shake. I don't know in our political community or environment that that is always the case, but attorneys know the judges they appear in front of, or they've done the homework, and anyone listening to this. As I have advocated in other, in other videos, know your judge. 
because something that they do, even if they're politically not your boy or gal, you could do well. And if, I've always said if someone is that dogmatic as to be one way and not listen to the other way, they're also open for manipulation. I think the more centered you are, the more open-minded you are, probably, how do I put this, perhaps a little bit more um, educated on the things in front of you as opposed to being dogmatic and only going the blue or the red way. It's just an opinion. I know this is going to, I might piss off a lot of people today and you'll never contribute. I'm not taking any money, but you'll never subscribe. Um, speaking of contributing, I don't contribute. It's a rare thing, but I do not contribute to campaigns. Um, <coughs> with this exception, my ex-wife, for many years, my ex-wife uh, was my wife. She's a politician. I contributed as much as I could, thousands of dollars. But uh, as far as judges, I know it's a good thing for a, maybe even a new attorney who does the work on a campaign, maybe to get appointments, uh, criminal appointments. I just don't think it's right for an advocate to contribute to the judge that they're appearing in front of. Personally, that's my opinion. It just feels, uh, it's a legal word, just feels icky to me to give them money for doing their job. With, again, with two exceptions. Well, the first exception is my ex-wife. If we had 20 more like her, she's a politician, the country would be in very good hands. And that's the position I take if I'm going to contribute to a judge. And I've only contributed to two. One was my neighbor, a little off the wall, so we just wanted no problems. That, And then secondly, there was this judge that I was just so enamored with that I thought to myself, yeah, like my ex-wife, we need to make sure they stay in the position they're at. And I contributed a nice amount of money, and it made me feel like I needed a shower even then. But I so wanted that person to stay on the bench that I just went against my grain and contributed. But generally, I don't contribute, and I don't think anybody should. It is your right. You know, uh, Citizen United, the basis of that a couple of years ago was it's a, it's a speech thing. And yeah, you have a right to do whatever you want through your pocketbook or your sweat equity. I just don't think contributing to a judge's campaign is a positive, and that's my opinion. Uh, speaking of things that aren't positive, I'd like to tell you some things that I don't like about judges. I'm just going to jump right into this. Um, 30 years of experience. I don't know if I've seen it all, because tomorrow I could get surprised. What was my re most recent surprise? Well, let me get into that. Uh, again, this is my opinion. Uh, the first kind of judge that I'm, I don't like Again, I didn't just get my ass kicked and oh, I'm going to go do a video because I'm going to tell you many things. There's no recent endeavor here. Um, <laughs> you may want an insight. You may want to have something confirmed where you go, I knew judges did that. Well, they do. I'm going to tell you my 30 years of experience. You know what? I'm not going to tell you because there's so much that I can tell you, good or bad. This, I normally am long-winded anyway and, not, and don't get to the point. I don't need to do this all afternoon. But uh, my, one of my favorite, non-favorite judges, and the irony bothered the hell out of me, is the five-minute judge. What is a five-minute judge? He, is to, he or she is to be celebrated. I love the five-minute judge as much as I don't like the five-minute judge. Once in a while, it's very rare, you'll get a judge that will schedule something for 8 o'clock and will start at 8 o'clock. It, it, it never happens. I Okay, yeah, I just did a recent thing. 8 o'clock, we had to be there. There was no one in the courtroom. It was a Zoom, and there was no one waiting in the Zoom locker room or where it was. We didn't get on until 9.15, and we specifically told... The, lady, the clerk for the judge, all very nice. Hey, look, we've actually worked this out. We don't even need to be in front of the court. 
An hour and 15 minutes later, he takes the bench. So what are you going to do? I gave him an earful. <laughs> That's my time. I, I, I won't let him tell me my time is not important. And I also know because of my, again, my ex-wife, I know what they're doing. <laughs> they're calling maybe what they're doing. They're calling fundraisers or they're calling friends. They, I know from personal experience, sometimes they're just talking on the phone or not doing their job. If you're going to schedule me for eight o'clock, I'm going to be there at eight o'clock. The one time I wasn't in 30 years, I just, I said, that's eight o'clock and you can't rely on that. I never did. I was a new attorney. I got there at five after and he'd already ruled against me, <laughs> defaulted me. So the impossible happened. My case was up first. It was full courtroom. I sat in the courtroom. Here's how embarrassing that was. For the first five minutes, for the want of a nail, a kingdom was lost. For five minutes, I wasted a hellacious amount of time. I sat in the courtroom just waiting for my case to be called. Finally, when no one was there, I went up to the clerk and go, hey, I'm still waiting. Oh, you were called at eight. You weren't here, so the judge defaulted you. Even the most tyrannical judges will go, oh, it's eight o'clock. We'll give him five minutes. This guy, the five-minute judge, that's what I called him. So now I got to go back, and it was like two hours away, like several times to get myself and my client out of that default. Fall on my so sword, say I'm sorry, <laughs> just for five minutes. So always be on time. <laughs> and you're going to be angry as hell because they never take the bench on time. One of the things you hate about that is if the judge, let's say they were an attorney for 10 years, which is a great judge. If they were an attorney for both sides of the V, even better. The worst thing is when that guy or gal is late and doesn't take the bench for an hour. Because who knows better than the guy that sat in the freaking courtroom waiting for their turn? Show that's so disrespectful, and I'm getting to the point where I actually say something. You don't say something, I've kind of had it, and I think justifiably so. So I'll find a way to weasel my way, like, Hey, hello, we were here at eight o'clock. And for the most part, they'll go, You know what, you're right, da, 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 da. but it's you can get your ass kicked, you can get your butt slapped if you go too far, which I've gone too far. Um, Judges have to have an eye on the next election. This is what they do for a living. So they're going to be doing stuff off the record and in the back and currying favor um, because this is what they want to do. It's a four hour job sometimes. <coughs> there are going to be some judges that say, hey, I work on the weekends, I do this. But we as attorneys know those judges. We know the harder workers, and maybe we'll cut them some slack if they're 10 minutes late and they're former attorneys. They know that we're sitting in the courtroom. That's cool. But when it's all about them and not about the people they serve, A, the community is who they serve. Um, I remember this one judge in, <laughs> here we go, a county court. The second she was eligible to retire, she hated the job so much. You'd go back in her. She was always looking at the door. She did not like that job. You were never going to do well. You just got to hope that she was going to go your way that day. The second she was eligible, gone. Across the hallway, maybe it was this floor on, let's say, the county building, this one judge would never show up on time on motion day, which is the busiest time of the week. It's a specific day to force all these um, motions in. It's like a, an airport. They overbook. And so you're waiting there. She wouldn't take the bench for the first case for two hours. And again, I've mentioned this in another video. I actually caught her once. Caught her. I was just so pissed. I was in the hallway. She passed me with freshly done hair and her shopping from uh, Kroger's. I had Kro She'd gone and done her own personal stuff. That's a regular Friday thing that she did. The thing that really pissed me off, maybe I'm doing this for a vent. 
But I want you to assume that I'm also confirming things and maybe take a position because I'm going to go into this a little bit better. Um, she would eventually, you'd eventually get up there. Now you're into the afternoon. And the first thing she would say is, have you guys talked it out? <laughs> what do you think we've been doing for two hours? And then she'd go, mm, I'm not convinced. Go in the hallway and try to work this out. She just refused to do her job. Um, as I said, there's a lot of judges that get appointed as political appointees. Now, understand that this one particular judge that I was in front of, he served in the state legislature. I got to be careful because I'm going to be in front of him again. And if you know anything about law, uh, the legislature, their members, they don't really, <laughs> when they speak, it's rare that they've written their own stuff. Someone's handing them talking points. And that happens for Republicans and Democrats. I'm not pointing fingers. And again, my own ex. There's so much to do. She's, especially if you're running for governor or something, you're going from one spot to the other. Uh, well, I remember just recently, we were on a Zoom and he's a new, he's a new judge. Somebody's hearing comes up and he's handed the notes what to say. And he's trying to pretend like he's doing it himself. But the camera was right there on him for some reason. I could see everything that I'd seen many times before in political campaigns. Uh, so that's a political appointee that eventually is going to have to run. Guess what? He's been running all his life. So he's gonna, probably going to be spending a lot of time on the phone. He's not going to take the bench on time. He didn't. He probably won't. He got the job because he ran out of uh, time at the legislature and somebody needed to give him a job and he was on the same um, campaign and same uh, party as the governors. All right, that's life. There's many reasons why people come to the bench. Those that keep others waiting when they know better are the worst. What you want from a judge is for the judge to be neutral. That is the number one criteria for becoming a judge, is to be a neutral arbiter or an arbitrator of two contested positions in front of you. Read the briefs, know the rules, know the law, make a decision based on the current law or the facts and or a combination thereof. That's literally how you write a brief. You present the law, present the arguments based on the facts, therefore the court, and then whatever's true to form, that's the definition of a judge's job is to go over the briefs, know the law, look at the facts. I don't know if anything personal has a role there, but personal we all are, we're human beings. Um, and one of the things that pisses judges Excuse me. I know. I don't know what pisses judges off. But I got what pisses attorneys off is when you, you there's no shortcut. If you've done the work, it's hard work. As I've said in videos about don't become an attorney, uh, which, by the way, the attor being an attorney is the best job in the, in the world, as I've said in the other videos. But one of the things that ruins it for you are judges that don't read the hard work of writing a brief. So when I'm done with a brief, I've probably written it nine times and it's changed along the way, but that's hard work. And I've given up other jobs that day just to get there. And it still goes up with a spelling error or two, or I missed a point. It's just hard work. And sometimes you'll get up there and it's clear she hasn't read the brief, not at all. Uh, and that can be a pain in the neck. So, how you deal with things in life, like anything else in life, is better than just sitting there and being mad about it. So what do you do when the judge, or you know, because attorneys know who the good judges are, or the readers, or the non-readers. It's getting harder, by the way. Um, you do what I do, and you've heard me say this before, a sticky, pink sticky note. What I really hope that they read I have a shiny, st pink, sticky note, maybe sometimes with an arrow, like 
just read this. Um, and I've advocated, even though there is no rule against it or, or requiring it, the preliminary statement. So no matter what you send to the court, even an answer, an answer is admit, deny, I'm not so sure, here's a couple of reasons, affirmative defensive. I put in a preliminary statement of my client's position. I want right out the gate to the court to know what's going on. Because up until that point, he's got an affidavit and a plaintiff accusation. Uh, so I preliminary this statement, everything. And you can go on collectionstop.com and see all my answers. There's, it might be 50 answers that you can steal from if you want a review. Steal is a strong word. <laughs> but you can use my work no matter what you state or in. Just I'm not giving you state advice. Just conform it to your state rules. But a preliminary statement advocating your position and make that your conclusion too, which is sort of brief writing 101 anyway, but it's not required in a lot of the stuff that I do. I do it. You can do a lot of things in this job that either you're not required or there's no rule saying one way or the other. And be an advocate. You just got to look for those places where you can get your advocacy in. And that's at the beginning of anything. I have a preliminary statement. I make it easy for the judge who doesn't read to know what my client's position is. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put this brief on the website, collectionstopper.com. I'm going to show you how in six lines, I wrapped up 50, a 15 page brief in six lines. Cause I suspect the judge isn't going to read my brief, even though it's pretty good. I mean, I, I willed it down to, as best I could. I got it down to six lines. And it said, fact, there is zero evidence of proof that Miss Debt was transferred or assigned to XYZ. And then underneath it, I put nothing assigned, an arrow to the company, then to the company that claims they own the debt. Well, if nothing was assigned to the one that gave it to the people that are suing my client, then they have no right or standing to sue my client. Then I wrote, fact, there is zero evidence of proof that Miss Debt was transferred. And I, again, did three words with arrows pointing that way with missing assignments. It's grade school stuff, but let's say I'm doing it for this one reason. Judge is in a hurry. And in this case, the judge may be looking to get rid of the case anyway. He wants to get slow, slow down his docket. So I've made it really hard for him when I've put it in six lines and pictures. Uh, next, it'll be emojis. <laughs> if I have to get my point across with emoji, I'll do that. But make it for the easy for the judge that doesn't read your brief. So attorneys, you know who doesn't do the work. Um, I think it's very disrespectful to not do the work, whether you're a judge or not. If you don't do the work, it's disrespectful to the system, to the profession, and to the hardworking advocates in front of the judge. He or she may say, look, the legislature's on us to get these cases in, get them out. But that does that never comes in the way of due process and a person's right to their her day in court. So if I suspect a judge is not, you know, if you talk to an attorney that's in the business a couple of years and then you talk to me, there'll be a divergence of how things are done. If I suspect a judge, a difference, if, if I suspect a judge is hasn't read, I'll say that. I'll go, did you read my brief? <laughs> it's not helping anybody, but I'm going to lose anyway if, if the judge is not going my way because he didn't read. However, you got to be respectful. I find them reading your brief for the first time or asking a clearly obvious question while claiming they read your brief as they're really reading it on the bench. And sometimes Zoom will show you that. I find that disrespectful, but I'll go the other way too. give credit where credit is due. A good judge is so you want to say, and I do when a judge has read your stuff. I don't mind losing to a judge if he's read my stuff. 
I'll say, thank you for your, thank you, Your Honor. I know the court does the work. So I'm not going to go into a long-winded detail about my case because this court will have read the brief. I love to say that to a court. I wish I could say that to every judge. Is that ass-kissing the same way as a attorney that contributes to the campaign or contributes money to the campaign of a judge? That's sort of ass-kissing for your client and big firms do that. Is, did I just ask his by saying to the judge, hey, thanks for being doing your job? No, because we don't have enough judges that do their job properly. And when one does, just like when you find a really good attorney on the other side, it's a unicorn. I think you should say something. If you're going to be negative, you should also be positive when something shows up. This is what I know. My, uh, it's a tough job being a judge. They are probably underpaid, but nobody nobody's like, hey, who made me judge? I mean, they actively pursue a judgeship. Yet they bitch and mo moan about how little money they make and all this. And, and I remember my ex-wife, who's in county government, I, she would share the parking lot of the, all the judges in that county. And that parking lot was empty or one. And that used to bother me because I practiced in that court. Um, so maybe they work from home. I don't know. During COVID, some did, of course. But that went on for many years before COVID. So you know who the hard workers are. You also know who aren't hard workers. And that makes your job hard. It should be a neutral person that wants the job as a vacation. Vacation. <laughs> I just, that's a fraudulent slip as a vocation, like a desire to do peep, do work. I always tell you in my other videos, if you want to be an attorney, do good work for others. It's just, it's, it's very religious sometimes. It's, that's how I, that's how I do what I do as far as a calling or altruism. I do a lot of free work. I love this job. I love helping people just as much as I, um, like helping people well you know i was a victim of certain stuff too and i'm helping myself clearly but i'm also helping others and i love that kind of work and i think a judge should not look at the paycheck or the clock and should uh unless they're getting somewhere on time all right i'm not going to keep doing this um one of the problems in my job is that i'm advocating that a client not pay a bill that's what a judge hears. A judge is a human being. I've had judges rule against me strictly because, in student loan cases, strictly because the, their daughter is straddled with student loans and they feel a little guilty about that. And they're making their payments. And, you know, my argument is always the same with these cases. They, my clients owe the debt. They just don't owe it to this person. And sometimes that's a bridge too far unless the judge steps back and is a neutral arbiter or arbitrator and is looking at both sides. And if there's clearly not a chain of title to the people that are now suing my client, that should be all she wrote. Um, but you're going to get in front of people with their hardened positions that don't want to do something, even though it's the right thing to do. You got to just keep fighting and keep advocating. You're going to get into a slugfest, respectfully, with judges. And this video is more of an um, instruction as well as an observation. Just keep fighting and maintaining your position. Because dogged advocacy always starts out as a pain in the ass. Until it isn't. Judges will respect you eventually if you maintain a position. There's, you know, there's a political party that is opposed to the one I'm in, although I'm more middle of the road, but I respect their advocacy and they stick to the bottom line and they all as a group stick to a bottom line. There's something that's, they they believe a certain thing and they stick to it. There's, there's something to that. Um, I'm gonna tell you one of the most uh, attorney's pet peeves is the following. 
I have this happen. A court has scheduled the trial in my case on the same day as a summary disposition motion at the same time. Gee, I wonder where the court's going on that. Are they going to rule for me or who didn't file the motion or the other side that filed the motion to end the case before the trial and all the work that's accompanying a trial? A good court, a good judge will recognize the work involved in getting that far into a case for both sides. Both sides are working hard and would not do something like that. That's a rookie move. By the way, that's um, that same judge that was a that is a polit was or is a politician and is just reading from notes. That judge scheduled a trial and a summary motion for the same day. If you get something like that, that means they're going to rule against you. If you're the guy that the motion is against, because the court's not going to go your way, then have to do all that work. Also, you have to do all that work. You got to not only prepare for that motion, but also you got to prepare for trial. On you can't like, well, I'm not going to go to trial. He's going to. It's only 99%. There's that one percent you could win. If a court, the court is signaling to you, I'm not letting you go to trial. I'm doing it on the same day. So what does one do about that? Well, you can uh, improve the odds. If you are facing a motion for summary disposition, which means we're going to end this case, judge, here's why. If you're facing a summary disposition, then file your own summary motion. Because it ups the odds. If the judge is all about, I just want to end this case and get it out of my hair. I don't know if he's going to say, I'm only going one way. If there's an opportunity to go the other way, I should win that motion if I do nothing else. It's clear my client is in the right. I know the law. I know it's a fax. And this other side is just filing BS cases. But they filed the summary motion on the same day that that's been scheduled for trial to be heard. Judge is probably going to go their way. So I will file my own motion and improve my odds. If the judge is going to kick this case, maybe he'll go my way. But if you don't file your own motion in that scenario, the odds are you're going to lose that. So what do I do in front of a uh, judge that hates me and my client? Well, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you about a case. A client of mine owed $25,000 in credit card debt. Uh, he was being sued by a company. Can I tell you that? Yeah, it's not important. That claimed to own the debt. And they were a down the chain debt by a bottom of the barrel that bought a ton of debt. And we're suing my client. And he didn't have an attorney. But he was pretty good. He's just a smart guy. Everybody's a smart guy. And he managed, you could tell, I read the transcript, he really worked the case to where it was clear that the people suing him did not have a right to the debt. The judge was having none of it. Because in the judge head, judge's head, I'm not letting this guy get away with walking from $25,000. It wasn't his debt. He'd gone through a really bad divorce. Whether it was or not, his wife had done some things and he was in a bad way. And it happens. Life happens. Divorces are the biggest cause of uh, financial problems right up there. Not as bad, but with medical debt. That's a killer right there. So divorce was happening to him. Life was happening. And he owed 25000 but not to this. It was clear. And he had proven this case. Judge was having none of it. Just shut him down, shut him down. He managed to get to trial, my client did. I think the judge had been so against him that he at least let it go to trial. And of course, guess what? The judge is the one trying the case. My friend, he's now my friend, my, my client, lost. He went to the Court of Appeals, this guy, just a regular Joe. And he won at the Court of Appeals. That's how bad the judge was. And the Court of Appeals gave him a fair shake. Boom, he goes back down. Guess what? He's got to appear in front of the same judge. Here's the reality. I know this story by heart, and here I have notes. 
but I know it by heart. Um, he gets a hold of me, and I go, eh, I don't want to go fight, because sometimes that's a bad thing to have a judge hate you from day one. But I read the transcript. I was so pissed. I felt like it was my duty on this earth to show, I don't know why I think this way, but the public that bad judges should not be accepted. So I looked at this transcript and it was clear the judges, judge was ruling against him and for the other side for no legal basis, just out of anger or bitterness or just, I don't know what was going on, but it was clear from the transcript. I go, I'll take the case. I shouldn't have, and, I, and I'll do that. I used to do that a lot more. It get me in so much trouble, but I, I don't like injustice like that. So I show up the first day and the judge's clerk and staff pull me back into his chambers and said, what are you doing? I said, I, I, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm here making my first appearance for my client. The uh, Court of Appeals said, this has got to go to trial again. And they go, don't even bother. I said, what are you talking about? You're going to lose. I said, hey, you haven't heard the, the case yet. I've got some good ideas. No, nope. judge has already decided you're going to lose. This was day one. And I knew I was in for a schlog. I was in for a fight. So I acted accordingly. Every chance I got where I was going to get my butt kicked, I put it on the record. I kept putting it on the record. I made the judge feel uncomfortable. There were times where the other side, and I knew the case. Woo, did I know the case. But there were times when the other side would, was specifically wrong, quoted the wrong statute, he would go, I think you meant 915. And she'd go, oh, that's right, Your Honor. That's what I was going to say. I mean, he was openly helping the other side beat this poor guy again. Because he didn't like my guy, who was not represented by an attorney, beating him, that's the way he looked at it, at the Court of Appeals. And he was going to make him and me pay and that's what he did. And he tried to F me every chance he got. And I would put it on the record now. When we went to trial, I'd go, hey, I know you're going to rule against me. Here's why you shouldn't. And he ruled against me. And I mean, I backed him into some legal, conceptually, intellectual corners where he had to go my way and he would get out of it. He just, And he'd have the other side go, is that the way you're seeing it too, counsel? And that person was clueless. Oh, yes, I agree with you, Your Honor, he would say. Um, but I put it everything on the record. I got in his grill. It wasn't necessarily like if I'm going down, I'm, I'm going to fight. I wanted, see, this is, I always preach this in my other videos, always be thinking ahead. It's so true. So what I was doing in my head was I'm creating a record for the Court of Appeals to read. That's all I thought about. I'm going to create a record. I pictured the Court of Appeals reading the transcript. So the judge wasn't an intellectual giant. He was so intent in being mean, and an emotion can really cut out your intellectual skills. And that's a tough thing, too, because I get very emotional. and I. But I was very structured. I researched the hell out of that case. I knew what the judge was going to say before he said it. And I already had three cases. It was just that I was pissed. But I saw the Court of Appeals reading the transcript as I created the transcript. And read it, they did. My guy won again <laughs> at the Court of Appeals. I don't know two, I don't know attorneys any attorney that has won twice at the Court of Appeals in the same case, this guy is not an attorney. I did not go to the Court of Appeals the second time or the first time with him, and I did not write his brief. His second brief was not good. In theory, we shouldn't have won the second time, but the transcript is read. You attach the transcript, and the court totally got it. They said, we're done with this. I'm not going to let this go to another trial. Client wins. They didn't let it go back for another trial. 
And that's what you got to do. You got to bear down and think about the case ahead. In that case, that was specialized to a very bad judge. But if you have judges that are not, just don't like you that day, don't change. Be respectful. Figure out how you can win. And if it's not doing it, don't change. Be a hardworking guy and stick to your position. But know your judge. Um, you may lose, and you shouldn't have, but you want to be an advocate where the next time he sees you, oh, that guy again. Well, that's really a compliment to me because I know that I put my best foot forward. And I'm going to tell you something about myself, and I, if it's you, then please take this advice. I am very contrarian. There's, I am weird, man. I'm wired weirdly. And uh, this is weird, but the second I sense that the judge is not neutral or on the up and up, I'll have no fear about respectfully pissing them off. It's an art. And I will take that relationship to as low as possible, to its bottom. My theory is, and it's, it works, that relationship has nowhere to go but up. And both sides in a warring relationship, they want to, they don't want to go through this and it can get really uncomfortable. I remember I was in, <laughs> I was in front of this one judge and he, he had some problems outside of court, but he was not having any of my legitimate, true, I should have won it, but he didn't want me to win. He, his theory was I hated all debtors. <laughs> he thought he was a debt collector. His phone went off while I was talking. I let him have it. You can't turn off your phone? What would happen to us? I mean, I just, you're in their grill. Um, but that is some of the best relationships I've had. They will, they will we will come to a, a neutral point, a detente. And they will respect you because you're a hard ass. But you're a hard ass and you believe in your position. The worst trial I ever went to, now I'm venting, was as a young attorney, I had like eight claims against the other side. I was going to win a couple of them. As a young attorney in federal court, there's a federal court, I was like, ugh. I kept hearing from the judge every time I went back in his chambers in a break while the jury was out. Hey, you know what, Parker? Why don't you just drop number three? Count three. You got, you've got count five and count seven. And I listened because, you oh, the judge is the judge. By the time he was done, I was down to two, maybe three counts. Guess what? <laughs> I lost. What I lost is the ability of the jury to go, eh, he didn't do this, but he did this. I just said, I pared it down for the judge, not for me, not for my court, not for my case. I learned from that. I learned never to listen to judges. That may sound unusual and contrarian, but my case is my case. Now, if the judge is advising me how to bring something in, going to listen. But if I can hear that the judge is just doing something for himself and not for me and not for my client, well, there goes that neutrality. You got to trust yourself. You got to be yourself. Don't, there's millions of attorneys. They're all basically the same. Be contrarian. You stand out, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But state court is a human, very community based production. It also has a lot of biases. And you can get hometown. What is that? I could be in a southern court, and I've been there, where everything is y'all, y'all, and the judge and the other attorney are talking about how they were at some hoedown or something. I'm, I'm being rude, but they were at an event that clearly I did not belong at. And now it's my time. 
to talk and I'm getting hometown. This guy doesn't have to work hard as hard as me. And if I work too hard, well, that's that guy coming in here and telling everybody how to practice law. So there's all these natural biases, even from town to town. I tried a case once in a very poor area, won it. And I made the jury put their hands up. Who's suffered from debt collection lawsuit? Buyers, you know, they all had. I went on the same case, same facts, different client in a very rich area. I asked the same questions. Nobody had been subject to debt collectors. Nobody could understand why my client wasn't paying their bills. It's just you're localized. The state has many, many fiefdoms. So you're juggling and negotiating so much more and different kinds of judges where, and I'm leading up to a point here, whereas in federal court, federal court is where you are reminded daily what it's like to be in a grand old profession. It's wonderful. It's, and, and, and to be honest, though federal judges complain about not being paid enough either, they are very well funded. They have great benefits. It's a very good position. And state judges, they want to be federal judges and they want the same benefits. They're doing hard work too. I'm not going to just crap on state judges. They do. They're all good ones. But you notice the bad one because it's so prevalent. Um, but federal judges, they work their ass off to get to that position. Even an appointee of a particular president He's had to do some jockeying and to get through Congress to get the job. Um, so they're hard workers, federal courts. Now they've got the job. They're not going to stop being hard workers. They generally will go your way if the law goes your way. Um, there are some hard lined, without saying their political party, judges that most people don't want to be in front of. And I believe they're the best judges because they're rule, they're law and order judges. So if there's a specific law saying, whoops, your client was violated, they're not going to take a political position. They're going to go, you're right. They're, and it's for those judges that shouldn't be there and maybe got a favor, the insecurity of what do I do? I'm now a judge. If the rule is telling them how to rule, it's quick and safe to go that way. They're not going to, there is going to be some, on big cases, I don't bring huge cases. There is going to be some, my party says this, my party, but for the most part, federal judges, great way to practice law. They're a joy to practice in front of. Um, it, they just remind you what a noble profession this is. Like it still is. And as I said before, the more good people we get in this profession, the better for the profession, the better for the public, the better for the public purpose of the state bar, which is to make sure everybody's represented. Um, but there's still a, an unpredictability of it. There's a federal judge that just seems to always go my way, according to all my opponents. And I kind of agree with them. I, sometimes I'm just sucking or it just doesn't go well, and then he'll find a way to go my way. There's still a lot of that, but I don't curry that favor. I don't look for that. But federal judges, they're not getting kicked off the bench. I've been in front of federal judges in their 90s, barely awake. 90s? Yeah, there was one guy. And by the way, there was a federal judge, 90, really sharp. But it's a job that you get for life. So you're not really look on the phone. You, they, when it's 8 o'clock, they are on the bench at 8 o'clock. They're respectful. And that's a pleasure to work in. Um, they will follow the law. Uh, I'm going to end this now. I could go on all day. For the most part, Federal or state, you get in front of a good judge, you know it. There's just a lot of non-working, non-open-mindedness uh, and a lot of 
the people that I talk to that complain about certain judges, the, what they have to say is, is largely true. My word to you, I've only been in front of one federal judge where I was never going to win. He actually knew my ex-wife, who was a politician, who had given his brother a complete tongue lashing. And he must have known, because it doesn't matter what I did. I'm really in front of that guy. Uh, and you better believe it's a dead nuts winner if I am. Uh, but for the most part, you got neutral judges at federal, kind of, in state. Again, the system is promotes political... Uh, there's a political underpinning there. We get these judges elected, so they're going to go where it best gets them elected, and that's elected. So you've got to work with that. The worst case scenario is what you do with that one judge I had that just hated me and hated my client. Make a record. The good thing about the Court of Appeals is that's a good place to go to get justice. It just now you got to wait 18 months and hope that you're right. Um, so it's still a good system. It's the best system in the world. This video is just to tell you my experiences, what to look out for, what attorneys like or don't like. And we love hardworking, neutral judges. We all should. There should be more of them. Uh, so I hope you come away from this believing what I do believe, which is I like the profession and I respect judges, but I don't like it when judges don't act judge-like. Again, this is all information, maybe educational purposes and strictly my opinion. And I thank you very much for your time. Don't forget to subscribe and I guess like uh, most importantly, all the free stuff are on collectionstopper.com. There's tons of stuff to practice with, and I'm building it daily. If you need anything, I just told you, please subscribe. But if you need a video, 30 years, hopefully in 30 minutes, this one went 53? Holy cow. Uh, 30 years and 30 minutes. I can give you... 30 minutes on any subject you want to talk about, just leave it in the comment. Email me at brianparkercollectionstopper.com and go on the website and get everything you want. Thank you.